Hello everyone, welcome to the 40th episode of the Online Tennis Podcast. I don't have anything to commemorate that, unfortunately. We're just... Four-o. Yeah, the big 4 It's me, Jack, and my co-host... Yep, Gavin, regular co-host back again this week. How are you doing? Good, thanks, Gav. Yeah, Monte Carlo finished, and in its week we had some... Um, honestly, really good tennis this week. I thought there were some amazing matches this week. Oh, the weather in Barcelona as well. I think yeah, weather because the weather in Glasgow was really nice last week, and the weather in Barcelona was like more like Glasgow. So it's as if I know, yeah, they switched. Uh, so they switched the regions about. Yeah, it's bizarre. Yeah, yeah. We had uh, Barcelona, Alcaraz won there. We had Belgrade, Rublev won there. Mm-hmm. We had Stuttgart, Svontek won there. That's the ones we're going to talk about this week, anyway. That's uh, the tournaments we're going to cover, and then we've got a few other things to talk about. We'll just dive into those first, I think. <laughs> A lot to talk about off the court as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah, but let's talk about that one first. The Wimbledon ban on Russian players this year. And Belarusian as well. And Belarusian, of course. Yes, sorry. How do you feel about that, Gav? Uh, well, I'm just going to go off the bat and say it's a disgraceful decision. It's a decision which is uh, an absolute joke. It's hypocritical as well. I've actually got a statement up here from the LTA. It says, this move has the support of the British public. Now, they, they don't provide any clarity on how they know that. They don't provide any evidence that it's got support in the British pub, from the British public. And certainly if you look at the comment section on Facebook and Instagram where the post was uh, put, you clearly don't have the support of the majority of the comment section of the British public there. So it's a statement for me that was an absolute uh, disgrace, poorly thought. Uh, but then again, it's the LTA. So, I mean, I was surprised that it's poorly thought or poorly yeah. as well. Also, as somebody raised the point, you know, when Britain and America had an illegal invasion in Iraq, they didn't ban British and Americans. No, oh, I mean, that, that, that's honestly, so, like, the comparisons to stuff like that are so fair, and it's actually mad. Uh, the, yeah, when you put it in that context, it yeah. seems insane that they would do this. The other thing to, to bear in mind, you know, I saw on social media that Ukrainian players were sort of calling for Russians to do more, and people being called from Russian tennis players to do more. People forget that, you know, ha- these Russian players will have family and friends in Russia. If they say something, they'll be scared in case the regime might do something to harm their family or friends. Yeah, and, I mean, I mean, we even had somebody like Rublev, you know, writing uh, End the War on the, the, the camera after he won so-and-so match a few months ago. I mean, even that, that's a massive move, and I wouldn't expect that's, that yeah, from players. Exactly. You know, it's just, I, I, I just can't comprehend how they think that this is a fair decision. I can't comprehend how it's a good decision. Uh, Patrick Moratoglu, I believe, said uh, this week that it would be a bigger threat to the regime to show Russians and Ukrainians like, you know, uniting in friendship at these tournaments or playing matches at these tournaments to get along with each other. That would show the world that, you know, we can, that it's not, they don't support the regime, that they can, Russians and Ukrainians can you know, play alongside each other and uh, show camaraderie and get along with each other. And instead, mm-hmm. this is just tearing it apart. This is almost like, not helping uh, to try and unite both nations together. Yeah, I think that's totally fair, Gav. The ATP and the WTA both taking a negative stance on the decision, actually, interestingly. Yeah. I mean, the ATP not one to speak out normally, so uh, mm. it's a pretty big deal. In Shanghai as well. After- yeah, I know, yeah, that's true. Yeah, good point. You know, so I mean, for them to, to make a stance on it actually kind of perplexes me. I'm not really sure why they did take mm-hmm. a stance on this and not other things but there you go anyway WTA made a statement on it so I, mm-hmm. I back that for sure uh, basically a lot of pushback mm-hmm. generally I am um, I, I, one advocate for the opposite definitely Marta Kostyuk has made it clear she doesn't obviously she's Ukrainian to be fair um, um again obviously we do not support the war I always want to say that big disclaimer that is obviously massive but to take it out on people who are bystanders in the situation. Yeah, it's, it just shows a bit of naivety there. It's as if she's almost saying that silence is culpable, but she doesn't understand that these players, if they speak out, or if some of them speak out, they, the families could be harmed, you know? Yeah. Families mm-hmm. could be harmed, so it's, it's a very delicate situation, but again, it is discrimination from the LTA and the LTC, whatever you say about it, it is discriminating, and it is um, highly hypocrit- hypocritical as well. Mm-hmm. Very disappointing that this is meant to be the event that's a major representation of our sport. And the LTA is the governing body. I mean, the, the leagues that we play in are LTA affiliated leagues. And for the LTA to just be so discriminatory and to come out with ridiculous statements without any evidence saying that they've got the support of the British public, where's that support? Where's the evidence of that support? There is I wouldn't, no that support. I'm, I, like, if that was a poll or whatever, even then, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, they. 
they chucked the the pole slap bang into like East London or somewhere like that, and, and well, got everybody to tell the Chiefs reviewed the board. I mean, they, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Guy, guy the statements. I mean, again, I just think it's an absolute disgrace and fair play to to, to certain players that did criticise Wimbledon uh, that were brave enough to come out and criticise I know Djokovic had something to say about it in his press conference yeah he was uh, just, vehemently against it which I thought was you know shows that uh, whatever you think about Novak that he's not scared to say what he thinks and get involved in debates like that whether you like him or not uh, he is like Marmite to some people personally I think it's a great thing that the world number one in our sport or the best player in the world in our sport is not scared to go against the authorities. We've seen that with the PPGA as well. They released their own statement. Mm -hmm. They were vehemently against it as well and that they supported the players. Yeah. One other thing, just to throw a bit of fuel on the fire. Mm -hmm. I saw an article said that there was a statement from one member of the royal family that said Kate Middleton would be embarrassed to have to give over the trophy to a potential Russian winner in the trophy ceremony and that that was part of the reason for Wimbledon's choice? Well, again, that, that, we don't know whether that's true or not. If it is true, then that's certainly disgraceful that uh, a supposed one member of the royal family can dictate policy in such a way. You've got to bear in mind that these players, uh, even the ones, we talk about the big high-profile ones that will miss it, like you know, Medvedevs and your Riblevs, your Palyachenkivas, etc., but, you know, there are players that are lower ranked that, you know, that might, may have qualified for the main draw that are working to earn a living and effectively they're being denied the chance for these weeks in the summer, the grass court season, mm-hmm. written to earn a living, you know, to, to earn, uh, to do their job uh, over what is a ridiculous policy. And again, it just comes across as uh, them trying to be self-righteous, you know, as if they're trying to make a statement. But um I'm I'm afraid for me it's just discrimination. It's punishing players uh, that have not got anything to do with Putin. I mean, it's just it's nonsense. It's a it's a ridiculous decision. I hope that the ATP and the WTA uh, agree to not give the tournament ranking points, and I hope the tournament does. As much as it painful it pains me to say, I hope the tournament does suffer a wee bit of the result. Mm-hmm. It deserves all the criticism it can get at the moment. Yeah, I also saw um, just one more thing on that. Mm-hmm. I saw. Rublev ask if Wimbledon could give out no prize money basically to Russian and Belarusian players and they could still play. I think that's quite a good solution because I also saw a, a statement from Wimbledon, somebody in Wimbledon, um, saying they wouldn't want Russian or Belarusian players to benefit from basically the, you know, the I'm misquoting this, I guess, but the prize money that they would give um, out to Russian or Belarusian players, essentially putting it in, framing it in completely the wrong way, um, kind of making it about money rather than about... Well, it is about money. It is, I mean, yeah. the world, the world, the world goes, you know, but whatever you say, these, these governing bodies only care about money, really. That's what it boils down to. It's all money, money, money. Yeah. Why can the ATP are still playing in Shanghai and are not pulling out money? Exactly, exactly. Well, WTA, why did they pull out of Shanghai? That certainly wasn't money. Because they will have lost a lot of money after that. They have a f- no. They, these- took, they took a stand. You got to you got to applaud them when they take a stand. But ATP are not taking a stand. Oh, not at all. Yeah, no. exactly. WTA are leagues that's ahead. Like, that's last really thing as well. You know, an investigation to that. They don't bother taking a stand. It's all about money. Everyone knows this. I wish they'd just come out and actually say it. You know, rather than insulting people's intelligence and trying to put yeah of this to come out with wishy washy statements. But I know. Yeah, yeah. I I know for a fact. I, well, I don't, don't know for a fact, but I would be very surprised if there was a domestic abuse case within the WTA, obviously it, oh. it doesn't happen as often with female players, but it could happen. The WTA would take an immediate stance on that. It would, it would just be, they, would, they would want to set a principle. They would want to set a statement. There's no way they'd let that just slide and pretend it didn't happen. The ATP were disgraceful about, with it. And I mean, it's just like... Yeah, but I mean, again, we've seen the ATP being disgraceful for loads of things. You know, but that Guillermo Villas documentary I keep talking about, he mathematically should have been world number one. Yeah. Instead of awarding him in it in uh, retrospect, like the WTA did with uh, Ivan Gulagong, I think it was she was awarded world number one when she wasn't given it at the time. That was like a few years ago. But mm-hmm. Vilas uh, showed the ATP the evidence that he'd compiled, and uh, they just said, no, we're not, we're not giving it. And that was Chris Kermode, who uh, was the previous chief of the LTA, uh, and has got pals in high places within the British press. So, of course, that story won't go into the any British newspaper. Uh, we know why. And. Uh, yeah, look, the ATP are a disgrace. Wimbledon's an absolute disgrace. I've got tickets for this year. Um, and as people rightly said, are they offering a partial refund? 
you know, are they all going to offer? No, I bet you they don't. Um, we've seen we've seen the way Wimbledon's treated the fans and its champions in the past. I mean, I said this in an article before as well. In 2018, they put Novak on court too. It seems quite trivial, but you've got to ask yourself, would they put any other multiple Wimbledon champion, men's singles champion in court too? I don't think so. So disrespect, disrespecting the intelligence of its fans and the LTA to say that they've got the support of the British public. I mean, mm-hmm. nonsense. absolute nonsense. I'm, I'm, I'm loving this rant, so I'm just going to do one more. Mm. John Millman said that he asked for a grounds pass a few years ago in Wimbledon and they didn't give him it. So, I mean, one of the members of the top 100 at Wimbledon, yeah, he was... basically was making the point, it's all about money. It is it's all, all about, about money. money. It's, it's ridiculous. Money. It's all about money. You know, and, you know, Tim Henman can come out there and say it's not about money. I don't, I don't care what he said. It's all about money. And this is meant to be the premier uh, sports tournament in our, well, in our sport in the world. Uh, but certainly the most prestigious tennis tournament, and for them to act in this you know, shocking way and be so discri- you know they are discriminating against these players, whether you like it or not, they're basically affiliating these players with a regime that many of them don't want to be affiliated with. Yeah, it's it's nonsensical, very disappointing, but sadly not surprising. I think that's the part we should underline: not surprising. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame. And I, Rome are, are considering doing the same thing, so I really hope they, they kind of do a, a backpedal on that. Uh, they've not actually done it yet, but there's been rumours of probably just overheard the tournament and director mentioning something about it. It might not actually happen. Um, but yeah, Rome are also rumoured to do it. Hopefully things get overturned. There's been a lot of pushback, so One more point on that. I think this shows why a PPTA is actually a great idea, having a players' union, because these players' rights are effectively being violated here i think it is mm-hmm. I think it would be a great thing for the ppta to be a real part of the sport and to have a players union that uh, wants more power for the players you know mm-hmm. and that that's a, that show this actually shows i know ppta had a lot of criticism especially from allies of atp board members in the in the press um mm-hmm. we won't we won't name them uh for certain reasons mm-hmm. but uh that this shows that uh a players union is needed now more than ever and i hope that does uh come to fruition and I hope the PPK does play a, a larger role in the sport because they did release a statement in support of these players and condemning the war as well. So hopefully that can have a larger impact on the sport but it's, it's, an, it's embarrassing to be a, a, an LTA member at the moment like, uh, like we are uh, by playing these tennis matches that we play mm-hmm. the Scotland League matches it's, it's an embarrassment to be associated with, it, with LTA after that statement. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm sorry we didn't really get to play devil's advocate there, but I suppose that that's for both our opinions on it at least. Definitely, I think we're both in negative camp, um, and you know there are arguments for the other side. In fairness, but uh, you know, it's both... up to the listener to make their own decision yeah. on it. But this, this is my opinion on it. I don't see the opinion on the side to it at all. I think it's whatever you say. It's it's all about money, and Western players wouldn't be banned in that situation. They definitely wouldn't, because we've seen them not being banned. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. So yeah, yeah, you're you're quite right. Um, right, a few other miscellaneous points. I'll just go over very quickly. Andy Murray's playing Madrid. We don't really need to talk about that. I don't know. He's just he's he's, he's he, got fed up, hasn't he? He's just, yeah, he's just got fed up. Exactly. You're what? quite right, Gav. I, did you see the Vadasco backlash and the Munar sort of backlash? No, no. The Vadasco sent a tweet basically expressing his disappointment and not being given a wild card and said I think that Spanish I don't quote me on this but it was something to do with Spanish players not getting wild cards for the event mm-hmm. owned by mm-hmm. IMG uh, Jack Draper's got a wild card into the main draw Yeah, yeah. And there was some question marks or some criticism of certain Spanish players over not receiving wild cards uh, lower ranked Spanish players not receiving more wild cards for the event yeah well I and don't know IMG owned. we see this from Miami as well IMG affiliated clients or players right. get wild cards. Mario Saka, for example, in twenty nineteen, Miami. Right. Okay. Main draw. Ma- money, money then. Oh, it's, well, it comes back to money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Oh. Uh, yeah. That's that's pretty bad. I mean, oh, well, we won't dive down that rabbit hole. But yeah. Um, we Just will... connection it anyway. You yeah. Yeah. It's like a... Asco's uh, Twitter account and read it if you. Yeah. And um, the other thing as well is that Emma Raducanu has split with her coach after five months or so. Torben Belts has been sacked. So what is what was it you said about the LTA this time, Gav? Yeah, <laughs> LTA. I'm sure they're going to offer to sponsor the podcast after this uh, episode. Yeah, so it was something to do with she's taking an LTA hybrid approach, or LTA are going to be involved in her 
in supporting or coaching, all I would say to him is good luck uh, if that's the case because <laughs> Jamie Murray uh, has had involvement with LTA camps before and that's the reason his forehand is not what it used to be apparently. And that that's well known as well. And the LTA, incidentally, just a final criticism of them, he published a document for the future uh, a few couple of years ago where he had it was like a 40-page document mentioning all the British players barring the Murray brothers. So mm-hmm. think of that what you will. The most successful British players ever not mentioned in an LTA document. So I gotta be careful, I guess, Gab. I I actually technically represent the LTA nowadays. Uh, well, so yeah. <laughs> you're, the, you're the company man, aren't you? Yeah, so I, I just have to hold my hands up and be like, Whoa, I am part of this. No, I I no. I, I definitely agree I'm getting on. Like hundred yeah. percent it's, it's ridiculous. So I'm pretty scared for him around to carry. Get out of that situation as soon as possible is all yeah, I would say. Run, definitely. Run for the hills, run as far as you can away from, from that. Definitely. If not, just for the expertise of a, a coach who's actually been there and done that, I don't think the LT are... I wouldn't yeah. recommend having me as a coach, for example. That's a terrible idea. No, I, I'm always, <laughs> I, but no, I don't know about sacking belts. I'm always sort of... I always sort of wary of players getting rid of coaches very quickly after they start. I mean, I think that's... What's that? Two coaches that she's sort of got rid of. Now. Five months is a while, to be fair, and the first was on unprecedented well, yeah, circumstances. But... It's it's one of these ones where if they don't gel, fair enough. But um, you know, it's a slippery slope to go under because if you start sacking coaches, you know, quickly, then more mm-hmm. coaches might be wary of uh, yeah, yeah, of you as a you know, a coaching you. So it's a slippery slope. Hopefully, she sorts it out. I'm sure she will. Um, but yeah, obviously that's a a major breaking story. And uh, yeah, as I say, it's slippery slope because if you start getting rid of coaches, coaches won't want to be uh will be wary of coaching you in the future. Yeah, definitely. Okay, we'll move on to some of the tournaments. Yeah, we got a good we got a good rant there. I love it, to be yeah, fair. Yeah, put that off the system now. I haven't had a decent rant like that, Gav, since the Davis Cup. So I mean Labour Cup, yeah. That, that's hey, Labour Cup, sorry, why would you well you ranted about the next scheduled rant will be in October then. Yeah, that. probably. Oh my god, that's a big one. I mean we already know what the ticket prices are, so Jesus Christ. Yeah, to Arena as well. So it's like growing the game outside of sport countries that don't get tennis. Cool. That'll be a fucking LTA as well, obviously. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, uh, yeah. I mean, you can hear a rant on that in one of the October podcasts if you want to delve down that rabbit hole again. But uh, <laughs> certainly, yeah, it's great for going the game outside of countries that don't get any tournaments. That, mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Fantastic for doing that, I'd believe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, it's just got to resort to sarcasm, though, Gab, instead of actually, like, full-on attacking. <laughs> like, if I go on full-on attack, we'll be here for about 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's just a passive-aggressive, sarcastic statement is, uh, mm-hmm. is, is all you need, I think, Absolutely. definitely. Okay, we're going to start, tournament-wise, <laughs> with uh, Barcelona. Mm-hmm. Did you see Cam Norrie's match against Martin Fusevic? So bits of it again. It was played on that crazy Friday. That was uh, <coughs> mental because um, of the rain. It was a nine yeah. foot ground pass, which they kept going on about on the commentary, which is great value to be fair. Oh, very good. That's very good. The twenty was it twenty seven minute service game or something like that. Twenty four minute service game in that match. That's the one. That's all I wanted to talk about. That's yeah. all I wanted to talk about it because uh, I think Cam Norris saved. Eight set points in that one game, yeah, and then um, went on to win that win that set and ultimately the match. So I mean, that's I just yeah. wanted to talk about that. That was it. Um, just quite quick. quick, quick. I've, I've not seen anybody save eight set points before. I don't think. I, uh, not not off the top of my head either. I've not seen it, I've seen that, but uh, I don't think we're going to get a longer service game than than that. This yeah, season. geez, oh yeah, it's crazy. Um, yeah, but let's let's talk about the the, the tournament winner. Because that, that's a, you know, it's very exciting. I, I'm sure everybody's heard about him to the nth degree, but I'd still like to talk mm-hmm. about him a bit. Carlos Alcaraz wins another tournament. But this one was a lot different from Miami. I suppose he had that match against Kecmanovic, actually. I and mean, that was pretty close. But here, yeah, he, he was up against the wall on more than one occasion. In fact, I think he had three... Three setters? Yeah, yeah. one in three. Over, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So yeah. first one they had was Sumu Kwon, mm-hmm. up 6 1 2 love before losing six games in a row in the second set. It just goes on. To... Bizarre, wasn't it? Just totally. Yeah. His, his range on his ground strokes, a lot of unforced errors crept into his game. And... Yeah, a lot a lot of people saying, and I think, you know, Gav, sometimes you might take this statement, but I wonder if you'd agree with me here, um, saying Sumu Kwon maybe deserves a bit of praise for what he did in the second set. It was, it was a lot to do with Alcaraz. 
I thought. Yeah, I think Quan's one of those guys where I love watching him play personally. Uh, he's sort of similar to John Millman in fact that he won't miss balls. So he won't. He won't make like thirty yeah. post errors in a match. You've always got to beat him, and he's difficult to hit too. And I think when you get that, and maybe players start getting the ball back and you get involved in longer exchanges, and maybe after you've taken the first set so comfortably, you think, right, I want to get off the court quickly, and then you start maybe trying to go for more than you really should. Mm-hmm. And you know that Quan is not going to sort of have an night, absolute nightmare on the court. He's very consistent. So if you start missing, you get frustrated, and all of a sudden the tight turn. Um, but yeah, majority of it was Alcar just losing his range. Yeah, I felt like that, and he picked it back. The important thing, obviously, was that he picked it back up. So can't read too much into it. I would prefer to talk about the match against Sitsipas first. That was, I mean, mm. yeah, he went on to beat Minar really easily. I mean, that was obviously mm. a massive win in itself. He, he barely lost a service point. Um, against Sitsipas, though, that was a very interesting match. Loads to talk about here, Gav. Mm. First thing I'd like to talk about, just a few of the sort of tactical um, elements of the match, or I suppose what happened during the, with the score as well. Akras was up 4-1 in the second set for a double break, lost that lead after his level kind of dipped out of nowhere. It was incredibly high for a while, to be fair. Literally, honestly, couldn't have played much better. I thought he was immensely good for the mm. first set and a half. Like Alcaraz's peak, man. Like, this is why everybody loves him. It's just insane. Mm. He was so good for a little while. Yeah, overall, though, I mean, the fact that he still managed to rally and come back, I thought was amazing. He he has a lot of advantages over Sitz Pass generally, and I thought mm. Clay might have evened it out. But honestly, Barcelona was playing kind of quick this week. I thought. Yeah, yeah. looking in last year anyway. Yeah, definitely. So it kind of it definitely worked in Alcaraz's favour and he still was able to get the advantages he had. On the hard courts, basically, of Miami and the US Open last year when he beat him. Yeah, and also, I mean, the kicker's probably even stronger for Alcaraz on clay. Like going mm. into Sitsipas's backhand, yeah, it, it, yeah like... Yeah, it, that, high up in the backhand, it's difficult for Sitsipas to yeah. go deep in the court on the return. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He pretty much, you know, that um, Alcaraz kicker and forehand inside in, that seems to be an Alcaraz play, basically, mm-hmm. that he goes to quite a lot and it works so well against Sitsa Pass. There's pretty much nothing mm-hmm. Sitsa Pass could do against that play. And, you know, it was an advantage he just always had. Um, I just, I, I found it really interesting how often Sitsa Pass hit a backhand, how often he would go on to win the point. He won 31% of the points with a Sitsa Pass backhand, and a lot of those were during the second set when Alcaraz's level dipped. So mm-hmm. most of the time, Sitsa Pass's backhand was getting barraged, even more so than it was on hard courts, to be honest, because mm-hmm. I honestly thought Sitsa Pass had a tougher time hitting through the court with his backhand than on a yep. hard court. So it's quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, his forehand, conversely, works better on clay. It but does. His back- the serve plus one on the forehand works really well in the clay. Yeah. But his backhand also generally works better against somebody like Alcaraz, who's going to absolutely leather the ball and give Sitsipas very little chance to you know, get on the front foot of his backhand. It kind of works the other way for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, anyway, though, how did you find the match? Did you, there was a bit of spice at the end of the first set. Did you well, see that? It was, yeah, there was a bit of spice. I, I didn't like the way Sitsipas was behaving, being honest. Uh, I've said this before, and I'll, I'll say it again. There's just no need to do it, you know. There's just no need to do it, and it's so blatantly obvious what he's doing as well. Um, we will just make sure we're on the same page first, and so the listeners know what we're talking about. Um, he hit a shot straight at the net at Alcaraz. Yep, he did. Yeah, yeah that's a, is yeah. that the one you mean? Is that what you're talking about now? Yeah, yeah the, the argument yeah. with the umpire as well. I'm just talking about his behaviour, sort of in general. Um, oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Alcaraz gave him a gave him a stare down, which was was quite nice to see him sort of. You know, sort yeah, standing up for himself. What's the word? Aggro. I mean, I hate that word, but I mean, it showed a wee bit of fight. You know, he wasn't going to take it. I just don't know. It's just it's frustrating for me watching it because you think after the US Open last year, it sits about bad, you know, stop this sort of nonsense with the breaks between sets as as well. Mm-hmm. Evidently, he's not taking that on board. There's just no need for it again. There's no need for it in sport. It's just. But disrespecting your opponent, I think. Uh, I don't mind. I'm all for aggression. I'm all for uh, spice when it, you know when when you need to uh, be aggressive or we need to hold your own corner. But I think when you resort to tactics like that, where you're deliberately putting players off, you know your opponent off. I don't like it personally. I, I don't yeah. Like it. Yeah, I, I sorry. Are you talking about the toilet break now? Because yeah. I know, I know that it's, yeah, yeah. Alcaraz said he was distracted by that. Definitely. Yeah, um, I mean, I, the, hitting the ball at Alcaraz. I thought personally it was more 
when you, when you look at Sitsabas with that aggressive shot he hit at him, he had no intention almost. It was never finding the court, you know what I mean? Like, with the way he was hitting it, it was sort of... Yeah, but, he's, you know, he's, I actually, I, I figure on Team Sitsabas here, he's expecting Alcaraz to hit the ball because it's coming at him so quickly rather than leave the ball and he kind of did, you know, he just got out of the way of it, basically. Yeah, um, I don't mind that as much. Um, but for me, it was like he's never making the ball there. It was it was obviously, he was all, like, just trying to, to hit him, which I guess is fine. I, I, I've done that in club tennis plenty of times, but it's really more... <laughs> yeah, you have, you have, Gav, that's more, true. More I've got a few bruises. My excuse is <laughs> the volley. That's why you test the volley. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, I, like the, I like the test, to be fair. It's not, it's not, not really hitting straight at him deliberately. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. The, the, it's really the toilet break I've got issue with and the constant coaching from his father. I know it wasn't as big a pre- uh, appearance in that match, but um, you know, people, there were some people on Twitter singing it was unfair because apparently since Sebastian's family had like microphones in the box in Monte Carlo. Did you hear that? that apparently Monte Carlo. And people saying it's unfair. How is it unfair? There's only one reason they've got them in the box and that's because he's been proven to have done it in the past. So it is yeah. fair. I mean, yeah. what are you saying? Oh, it's discriminating. Well, how many other players' coaches try and deliberately coach during the match? No. Yeah. I mean, come on. I've just had enough of it, really. I mean, the toilet break. The toilet break for me. I was just. I was literally. I was. I was getting angry myself. You know. I mean, yeah. if I was Alcaraz, I would have probably said something to him because it, this can't keep continuing. Honestly. Yeah. yeah. What's going on. He just. He. he it was ironic because it's past. Actually, didn't know the rule. Even though he was he was the one that basically made the rule come to, to fruition, yeah. basically, um, you should know the rule. He uh, just to to clarify, you can mm. take a toilet break at the end of the second set. I actually don't know how long that's meant to be. Certainly, I couldn't find that. Certainly not meant to be the t- length of time that <laughs> sits past two. You know, what no, I mean? well, at the end of the second set, it was Alcaraz that took the toilet break, and that was a wee while. And I don't know if that was over the limit, but it's certainly longer at the end of a set. That was, that was in response to Sitsipas, wasn't it? Taking no, 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 it wasn't. It wasn't. So that was actually first. And then Sitsipas's was mid-third set, and that was about, I think it was three... When you go out of the set, you have three minutes to go to the toilet. If you need a towel as well, it's plus two minutes. Sitsipas just had those three minutes. He went longer than that mid-third set, and that's why he got docked 30 love, basically, at the start of the... Um, fourth game. The problem with these these toilet breaks as well as I think people are rightly saying in certain tournament sites the bathroom might be further away, you know, I mean from the court, or it might be closer to the court. It's, I think that's why it's difficult to sort of come up with a pure blanket rule because you'll have tournaments where, especially the outside court, you need to walk to the bathroom to be, you know, miles away, or there might be tournaments where the bathroom's right at the side of the court. Um, yeah, for me, just. I don't know. I just I get almost get sick of talking about toilet breaks now because it's I know, yeah, so long. Honestly, it's just like it's, it's frustrating. But uh, yeah, like, like like well, we can move on from it. There was a lot of controversy there. It's kind of good. Alcaraz kind of came through because since the past was baking rules without even knowing he was baking rules, which is not yeah, on, obviously. You love his defenders, but for me, it's like, no. No, that's not a good thing. I think that's a bad thing. That's definitely against him because he was the guy that did the toilet break that brought on the rule. So it's like. Hey, let's talk about Carlos Alcaraz v Alex de Menor. Mm-hmm. Mental, crazy. Mental, it was so mental. A guy who has barely won a clay court or back to back clay court matches in his mm-hmm. career certainly comes up against the you know one of the form players on probably well we're still not sure what Carlos Alcaraz's favorite surface is, but he's certainly <laughs> playing amazing at Barcelona. <laughs> yeah, we're, he's still playing amazingly at Barcelona, obviously. Um, and he almost, almost takes him out with some very interesting tennis to counter Cor- uh, Carlos Alcaraz's. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I thought it was so interesting that Carlos Alcaraz almost got unstuck by Demonor. You just talked about soon with Quan being able mm-hmm. to get every ball back, basically. Demonor also gets every ball back, but in a different way. They're so flat and they shouldn't mm-hmm. work on clay, but mm-hmm. it just seemed to sort of mess with Alcaraz. And I think it's the depth that Demonor gets in every ball, especially especially the returns. There was very little serving advantage that mm-hmm. Carlos Alcaraz could I keep saying his full name, that Alcaraz, Alcaraz could uh, give himself basically on every service game. And yep. that's why he got those two breaks back to back at the end of the second set and why Demonor was almost able to take him out. Yeah. Um, yeah, the forehand, the forehand, will be having, you'll be having nightmares about the. Yeah, well, well, this is such an interesting point of discussion because is it a was it a bad shot on match point from Dimino? No, I think it's it's obviously difficult when you're in that situation, but I think people were saying be more aggressive, you know, just be more aggressive. I don't think he got it the depth quite 
right to secure the point. We obviously no, I, I saw that as well. I think a little uh, a t- tiff between uh, Owen Lewis, who I was talking to last week, and mm. Owen from uh, Popcorn Tennis. I am probably team Owen on this one, I think. Mm. I, I think Dimonor shouldn't have hit down the middle of the court. No, no, I agree. I agree with that. He shouldn't have hit. Just put it ball, in, ball away in that one of the angles or probably forehand side um, cross. But uh, when you're up the middle, you're always giving your opponent the chance to get it back with a miracle shot. And this is Carlos Alcaraz we're talking about here. So mm-hmm. he's obviously going to find a way of getting it back, the way he's playing at the moment. Um, mm-hmm. Can't really give Dimono too much criticism, though, because how many times yeah, of course, the, the of club course. players just thought, oh, we'll just put the ball back and make him play the ball. But And uh, for, it, for it, Alcaraz yeah. to come up with that shot, to be fair. Yeah. But I still yeah. think I still think he could have hit it to a more aggressive spot. Definitely. Could have, that, well, absolutely could have. But, there's I mean, got to be a bit of nerves in that shot. Cause, oh, oh, look, we know as club players, just on a slightly uh, worse level, a slightly lower level. Well, but, slightly, but, yeah, yeah. Point, you almost, some people sometimes you have the mentality of right, just make the ball back, make the opponent play the ball, make the opponent play the extra ball, rather than take the aggressive option of put the ball away, put the ball match away, it's on your racket, put the ball away. Yeah. And sometimes we think, oh, we don't want to be too aggressive and we don't want to miss the ball, so we want to make them almost try and miss the ball. You know what I mean? We don't want we want to almost take it away from our own controlling our own destiny in a way uh, by taking that mentality. But but you can't give Demon too much criticism because as I say, how many times is Al Graz going to make that shot? You know. That's mm-hmm. uh, it, it was such a shame. Like it, it, it was a mental shot from Alcaraz. Um, yeah, did you also see during that game where Dimonor tried to serve it out at the start of the game, Alcaraz had a, a wee argument with Carlos too, Bernardes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he was certain that ball was out, or whatever it was, mm-hmm. in or out. Um, he was certain it went the, the opposite way from the line judge's call. He had a pretty long discussion with Carlos Bernardes, longer than I've ever seen him talk to an umpire, and it ultimately accepted the call. I mean, I think on replay we saw that Alcaraz was correct, mm-hmm. um, and he just he he just took it. It was just like okay, cool. And if that was Andy Murray, there's no way, there's no, no way Andy Murray would have been winning that match. I'm sorry, yeah. there's no way. Because he would have been absolutely fuming. You, you would have still been talking about it now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. He'd have been tweeting about it. Love you, Andy. <laughs> but Jesus Christ, you don't let stuff lie. <laughs> but they were showing highlights on tennis TV of the Murray Djokovic Miami 2014 quarterfinal. You know the controversial racket? Yeah, oh my God. Yeah. yeah like, it shows a change of ends. And literally about five times at change of ends, Murray's talking to the umpire about the goal. Just mm. funny during like a four minute highlight video. We've got five minutes of it. <laughs> It's what the fans want. It's what the fans want. <laughs> yeah, honestly, yeah. Anyway, yeah, amazing for him to come through that and for him to win in the end because actually Dimonor didn't really go away in the third set. Um, no, he didn't. He didn't. Uh, it was really impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the, the final, unfortunately, was a little bit underwhelming. I mean, PCP tried his best, but... Um, if Diego had got through, it might have been a more interesting mm-hmm. final. Not, not taking anything away from PCB, but um, when you look at Diego's clay court pedigree compared to, not that PCB is a bad clay court player because he did win in Hamburg last year his first ATP 500 title but he's just not got the sort of weaponry to consistently put Alcaraz under oh, pressure no. and he's not got not at all he's not got the defensive skills of Schwartzman to make him play the extra ball consistently so yeah for, yeah, for me it was an absolute sort of bog standard this is what we're going to see from Alcaraz against players outside the top 10 for years to come you know just like I felt a bit sorry for Munar during that match. I thought I thought Munar's match round I thought Munar played actually not not too badly. He played he played all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah but he just got hammered at the same time. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, PCB had a he, he hit hit him with the odd sort of forehand inside out to actually get to actually win aggressive points against Alcaraz, but everything else was going Alcaraz's way. Obviously, PCB is like might actually be the slowest server bar maybe Schwartzman in the top 50 in the world mm. uh, when you're playing a returner like Alcaraz I'm pretty sure he lost as many service games as he, as he won actually yeah. um, so yeah. uh, genuinely so um, yeah it was, it was always going Alcaraz's way massive respect between the two players though I like to see that obviously at the end they were both hugging yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. And they were hugging each other's teams and stuff and, you know, saying congratulations and that. So it was really nice to see. Should we move on to Belgrade? Yeah, we should. Yep. Yeah, let's let's fly through. Uh, yeah, we'll start with Djokovic's first match against Laszlo Gere. Mm. In fact, you know, we can just fly through these, basically. Before 
before the finals, Djokovic played um, three matches where he was a set down, two of them a breakdown. The first one against Laszlo Ger. Ger actually played a really high level. He did. Be- probably should have won that match, actually. Yeah, he should have won. He just got a bit tight, which was yeah. not surprising. Up a break and forty fifteen. Um, yeah. a, a couple. Oh, he had that forehand on the net, yeah, didn't he? Before, everyone talks about the forehand. Yeah. Yeah, forty thirty. Oh, 40, Jesus. 30, yeah. Yeah, he, he should have made that, and he was winning that. I mean, that was a winner. It was a straight mm-hmm. winner for sure if he made the the shot. And um, yeah, came the jock of his race. We came through in two two tie breaks. So mm-hmm. yeah, it was Jenner's match to win rather than Djokovic's. To be honest, it was a very Djokovic esque match exactly. in some ways, but yeah. in other ways not so much. Catch Manovic, actually. That was more Djokovic, definitely. Because that... the two backhands that you hit to, to finish the match. You see that? And that wasn't a flash in the pan. He was hitting those a lot during the match. Like, yeah. he, he was hitting a lot of amazing backhands throughout the match. Um, yeah, that was the best he's probably looked. Best win of his year. Oh, so far, easy. A mile easy. easy. Catch Manovic yeah. easily made him play top 10 level stuff because mm-hmm. Catch Manovic was playing top 10 level stuff. And I loved the, the roar from Novak when he won the match. It was like 2011 Wimbledon vibes, you know, when he, that, yeah. I don't know if you remember that final, but like the cross court backhand and the, like that. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, just, yeah. That was, extended, that was, extended grunt. Extended grunt. We sort of saw yeah. it against Berthini at Roland Garros last year when he won. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. Well, that was that was that was something else. That was weird. But, oh. uh, <laughs> no, I, I was like, what the fuck is going on? That's uh, like, so yeah. yeah, bizarre. Um, no, uh, he he was amazing in that match, and I, I think he, he that came talk- match that turns around his sort of clay court season, sort of similar to like the Sitsa pass one in Rome last year. Yeah. That sort of switch turned his fortunes around. I can certainly see that. And again against Hashinov, he came back with set down as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it was like one and two in the th- second and third sets in Novak. And- yeah, yeah. At that point, Djokovic was just losing first sets for fun, to be honest. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, amazing matches. And just before we go into the final, I would say if he can reach particularly the level he did against Kechmanovic at uh, uh, any time this clay season, he should be okay against most players. In fact, yeah, all players, if he can get his fitness up, to be honest, he can definitely give them a good battle. Uh, but the fitness is what we're going to get on to because against Rublev, for mm. me, that is the reason he lost that third set. Yeah. And that's not like Djokovic. Although he, okay, so he has been talking about, I think, was it COVID or was it something else he got? I don't know. He got COVID, an illness. No, it, was it was COVID, yeah. It was COVID, yes. He got COVID recently and we are thinking that's the reason for him looking a little bit spent in his third sets in Monte Carlo in his third mm. set against Rublev, where he yep. has been bageled, incidentally, if you didn't see the score. Yeah. Um, yeah, crazy. It's not really Djokovic. It's not. Well, Djokovic is throwing down for his physical fitness and capability and never to really lose his energy. And, you know, to see that twice so far this clay court season, that's a bit... Well, it's jarring, isn't it? It's totally jarring. Yeah. I mean, he's like he's got the best record in deciding sets. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure he overtook Nishikori recently. Yeah. Um, so, Nishikori, obviously, the MVP of, of deciding sets. But Absolutely. it could be... Yeah, give me Joe Fletch now. Yeah, I, I'm. To be honest, I'm a little worried because I don't. I you know, his fitness may not just miraculously get better within well, the next well, month. I don't think it's really going to be tested, isn't it? I mean, it's going to be very difficult for him to get through two weeks if, he, if he's struggling to get through like three set matches. Um, mm-hmm. That's a worry. That's a big worry. Yeah, it's a big worry. It definitely is. That's and scary. he pulls up in Rome and Madrid, though. If he if he starts getting better, we might say, oh, you know, he's got over it or he's found a way to solve it. But yeah, it's it's sort of concerning at the moment. Yeah, he's still not got a way of winning points quickly. I know I said that in Monte Carlo. It's the same here, to be honest. Well, when he was playing well, he did. But certainly against uh, Rublev, when he started to dip, it just looked like he, he had no way of putting his forehand away again. In fairness to Rublev, absolutely amazing to sort of mentally overcome not overcome, but mentally uh, deal with playing yeah. Djokovic in Belgrade and beagling yeah. him at his home yeah. tournament, I obviously. I remember Rublev's comments before the match at the Ito ATP finals last year where he said, oh, I'm just hoping to get a few games. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think he, you know, I think he knew he was playing a different Djokovic, to be fair. And, mm. um, I mean, Djokovic on hard courts really is still a different beast to him on clay. Yeah. I know Djokovic is still an amazing player on clay, but he plays mm. a totally different game on hard course. So. Indoors as well. Indoors as well, exactly. Mm. Um, basically, Djokovic is home turf, away from home in some ways. I'd like to leave the sort of match itself there. I don't mm. know if you saw Rublev talking about the hospitality he received in Belgrade compared to... Did you see this? 
No, I, I, no, I, no, I, okay. He must no. have loved it because he did sort of. Tw- he, his Instagram was in Serbian, wasn't it? Or he sort of tweeted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He said, uh, just to throw a bit more fuel in the fire because it's funny. Uh, he said last year he was in Barcelona and he. <laughs> I paraphrasing paraphrasing was treated like shit apparently because apparently it's only spanish players that get any sort of decent treatment there mm. and in belgrade this is not paraphrasing he said he was treated 10 times better the, i tell you the clear there looked 10 times better in barcelona as well i mean i don't know if you saw the pictures in the rain he actually Played- <laughs> used, used the main court in barcelona for the sits of yeah match because of the state it was in it looked like a mud bath it didn't cover the court but you look at the court surface in belgrade it looked much better like, it looked- well it, it probably wasn't raining in belgrade to be fair no, i know but like even if even in the dry i thought like when you're watching it i actually thought the clay in belgrade did look a wee bit better i also thought it played a bit more like clay um, Bar- yeah. Barcelona, Barcelona was definitely a lot faster, and I think that's not doing it. Well, it's doing people's favours from Madrid, maybe, but going into Roland, the Roland, Roland, Gar- the Roland Garros, and Roland Garros, even, um, it's definitely given people a false sense of security, I would say. Um, fans, at least. Interesting from Rublev. I don't think you'll be expecting a higher entry fee into Barcelona anytime soon, but it, do- it does answer the question that I thought of why is he not going for the ATP 500 slam or whatever with the Barcelona? Why is he playing a 250? There you go. Do we know why? You unanimously answered that that question. Yeah, there you go. I, I thought it was quite interesting. Move on to Stuttgart. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Igor Schwantek continues our mental run. First, very first thing, actually. Um, Bianca Andrescu made a return. I don't know if you yeah. saw her. Didn't, she, didn't see that, though, no, but she, she, what, what, what uh, stage did she reach? She, I think she won one match, I believe, and then went out to Sabalenka. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think that's right. Pretty sure she would have had to have won a match to to yeah, get to yeah, that stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she took Sabalenka to three sets. To be fair, but um, you know Sabalenka being Sabalenka, it wasn't all and rescue. To be fair, um, but still, I, I very encouraging stuff. Actually, I wasn't expecting her to play that level on her first matches back. To be honest, um, she she was a lot better than I was expecting. So keep an eye on her. Clay's not even our best surface. Stuttgart at the same time, again, not really typically clay. A one-off, um, isn't it? Indoor clay. It's like yeah, exactly. It, it play again. Play, it sort of benefits power hitters for sure. Um, and Andrescu certainly is a, a power hitter, so she she did pretty well in the conditions. She may struggle in the upcoming tournaments, but it's it's good signs for her overall. Definitely, still still very young. In fact, what age is she? Is she twenty two? Twenty. She's still twenty one. So there you go. Even younger then. Yeah, even younger. Yeah, yeah. so she's, she's got plenty of time to, to come back and who knows, maybe win another slam. We'll see. I'd like to talk about Shawn Tick. Yeah. A, lot of, a, lot of peop- a lot of people online going mental about the fact that Alcaraz is going to get talked about in every podcast and Shawn Tick's probably going to get about two minutes of air time. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to talk about her a, a wee bit, definitely, because she, she, what she's doing is, is insane. And it's, it, could, it, it, it could be the start of a biblical run. No, I mean, like one that goes it's down and yeah, yeah, could, yeah, yeah. It could be especially for the WK to see that level of consistency week in week out. We know how much tougher it is almost to be consistent in the WTA. Mm-hmm. And uh, how many is that? Like twenty? Certainly, it's over twenty. Um, and four titles in a row, isn't it? Four titles. I love the celebration. I don't know if you saw the celebration, yeah, yeah. Um, but the the four four fingers up to the camp. It was amazing. So uh, it's just so understated and very confident. Michael Jordan style vibes, I think, just for that. Just like, like yeah, yeah, I did like that. It was amazing. Um, it wasn't all easy though, and this is what I'd like to talk about. I'd like to talk about her against Samsonova. You may not have seen the match, Gav, possibly, but it was but yeah, it was an epic. It was so good. Samsonova <coughs> by far the closest person to winning a set. Well, she did win a set. Sorry, to win winning a match uh, from Shontek in her twenty four odds match win streak. I'm not sure on that number. Asterisk it. But um, over twenty Sam- is probably safe. Over twenty, yeah, uh, twenty plus match win streak. Samsonova took a set off her. She took the first set in a tie break, and then the next two sets were incredibly close. Again, people are struggling to win more than four games at a time in a set. Mm-hmm. For Samsonova to take the next two sets to as close as they were, seven five in the third. She is an amazing player. I mean, I've seen her play so many times. I think she is still struggling to kind of put that together consistently in a lot of her games. But the one thing I didn't really know she had as well in her arsenal that she does have is an amazingly placed serve and a lot of variety on it and that was what Svontek was struggling with placing first serves out wide follow that up with a kick serve down the tee to the backhand 
basically just stuff to stop the best returner in the world at the moment from being able to return consistently. Mm-hmm. And I mean, she went a set and a half basically before she, or she, I suppose she got broken right at the start, sorry. But after that, she didn't get broken for a long time. And it was because of how well she was able to set herself up in the following mm-hmm. shot. I mean, her forehands is insane. It's so good. And it's like one of the only forehands on tour that can keep up with Schwantex at the moment. Um, yeah. I mean, there were times where Schwantex relies on the forehand cross a lot because, I mean, as soon as she hits that shot, she normally pulls her opponent so far out wide, she's got, you know, a million options, basically. Samsonova was sometimes able to do that to her first, and for anybody to do that to her first, I mean, I saw Sabalenka in the final pull that play off zero times, put it that way, and she's got a massive forehand. Uh, Samsonova did it a bunch of times, even finding places in the court for Schwantek to be wrong-footed, you know, placing the forehand amazingly. She's such a good player when she's on. She's so what's the word, I don't know, focused, I guess. She, there's just no mentally nonsense, tough. basically. Yeah, mentally tough, exactly. There was no nonsense, nothing, you know, sort of flustering her at all. She just kept her head down and kept going, even when she was down a break in the third set, got that back. In fact, I think she got broken twice in a row and brought the break back twice in a row mm-hmm. um, against somebody who's barely been broken in any of her matches as well, Sean Tech. Oh, it was just so impressive. And obviously, maybe this is more about Samsonova. Maybe I've been, I could give you more about Sean Tech, actually. Um, uh, that loads of Schv- Samson over praise there. Schwantek able to bring it back though in the second set, started bringing out the backhand cross court approaches. I mean, the fact she is thinking of anything different, you know, when you've got somebody who's on a 24 match win streak, they're probably going to be using the same sort of tactics basically every match. It's got to mm-hmm. be something consistent, tried and tested. The fact that she was able to think outside the box when she was down four all, love 15, for example, bringing out the backhand cross court approaches I mean that's just that's number one please right there definitely um to come up with something a bit different to come up with something a bit risky and find that it's working Samson has got a bit of flat backhand I don't know if she was aware of that but it made it a lot more difficult for for her to to pass her basically mm-hmm. if she uh, she rushed that shot so loved it it was such a good match and for Fonte to come through obviously that was the match that deserved her the the, the title right, definitely yeah. 100% so good and she kind of just came through it by scrapping with her, her usual style of play only just um, got the better of Samsonova who was absolutely amazing I would expect her to do really well in Madrid Samsonova but mm-hmm. obviously she could go out in the first round yeah. so we'll see <laughs> oh, we're trying to find that consistency but uh, yeah spot on agree with everything you've, you've said there certainly a scrap I think that's certainly the, the key word to use a scrap it, it yeah, well, well, it was t- it, you know there was tidy stuff from Samsonova, but for Schwantek it was, um, it was yeah, it was a scrappier about... match for her. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a little bit on the final <laughs> Schwantek v Sabalenka. The fact that Schwantek is rocking up to matches nowadays, beating top ten player, top five players. As so Sabalenka might just be outside the top five now. No, I think she is. No. Um, the fact she's rocking up to these matches and she's losing four games is <laughs> that. That's why I'm thinking, you know. Streaks like Chris Everts, Navratilova's, Serena Williams, these sort of streaks come to mind because she's winning matches like that so easily like against yeah. the best players in the world. Like yeah. there's, n- there's no reason why she couldn't rock up to the French Open and again not lose more than five games in one single match throughout mm-hmm. the tournament. Like yeah, playing like that. Certainly worrying for the other players in the tour, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, 100%. There was. There was like one play Sabalenka got Schwantek with. It was the backhand cross followed by the backhand line. I would argue Sabalenka's backhand is actually better than Schwantek's. But we've all seen Sabalenka play and those sort of plays, the riskier ones, are definitely going to be few and far between, let alone her normal play, Mm -hmm. which is also pretty risky. Um, But yeah, to go backhand line over and over again, if that's your way of beating the world number one, it's probably not. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Good luck. It's probably not going to happen. Um, yeah, Sean Tech was amazing. Yeah, do you see Sab? Which is nightmare that just consistently. Well, I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It consistently red line isn't the best tactic in the world, is it? Yeah. I don't know. Did you see Sabalenka's speech at the trophy ceremony? Yeah, sort of a bit, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I didn't. Well, I'm not a fan of it. I didn't think you'd be a fan of it either. No. A little bit. Um, what's the word? Not disrespectful. Well, a little bit disrespectful. It was like it sits past Brooks Bay press conference vibes, wasn't it? Yeah, not as not not not, not really. Not, not as not as sort of moody, blatant as that, but it was certainly uh, 
not taking anything away from Svantec though at least, but yeah, still sort of um, not giving her praise, I guess. Nothing negative, but certainly. You really need to be like in the PR for two minutes and just go off and vent your frustration off the court. You know what I mean? Just hold it together for two or three minutes for a speech and then just do what you're going to do. Also, you've got no throw rackets in the ball or. Well, I'll give her I'll give her the benefit of the doubt on translation to be fair because I think she was meaning to be a little bit more funny than she she was I guess <laughs> when she was like I'm not even doing a final speech next year if I lose in the the final again and I'd just like to be off court right now sort of thing <laughs> um, yeah it did seem a, a little bit petulant maybe I don't know I think we covered pretty much we've had, we covered quite a lot there I would say. Um, I don't think we missed too much really that's worth talking about maybe sorry we didn't get onto Istanbul maybe I'll make the acknowledgement of that I guess didn't mm. quite have time um, there was a lot of off court stuff to discuss really so there was, was exactly that took time. that took precedence you're quite right that was the priority um, next week we will be talking about yeah we'll be talking about Estoril we'll be talking about Munich Munich mm-hmm. there's no other WTA tournament song They've yeah. been few and far between. Mm-hmm. The ATP seem to have had way more. Trying to navigate that new combined app. You know, just... Oh, well, it's, it's better it. than nothing, no? Yeah, just taking a while to get used to all the format. Yeah. And stuff, you know. yeah. yeah, no, I'm glad they made that move, just for anybody who doesn't, doesn't know. It's a good move, but it's sort of like, I'm so used to seeing the other one that's sort of like trying to navigate out now. What's the what's the name of the app, Gav, for people at home? ATP WTA Live, I think. Right, yeah, so it combines both um, tour and scores. And your tour scores there as well. Right, we'll leave it there, Gav. Good. Thanks, for everybody. Uh, thanks to everybody for listening this far through and joining us on the big 4-0 of our podcast. Mm. We will catch you next week. We uh, Before you go, sorry, of course, you can catch a bit of my work on onthelinetennis.uk. You can catch yeah. Gav's work at Last Word, Last Word on Sports. On sports. Yeah. Yep. Um, give us a follow on Twitter, etc., etc. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll catch you next time on the Online Tennis Podcast. Cheers, guys. Cheers, thanks. Bye. Bye.